Hi, I'm Jane Sheldon. I'm a soprano and I am totally thrilled to be singing in the 2014 Resonant Bodies Festival in New York. I'm singing on September 3rd. I'm the first set, 7.30. So it was very tempting when given the luxury of just free reign to program whatever I wanted. It was probably tempting for all of us to uh, do the most pyrotechnic thing we could think of, <laughs> like get the bag of tricks and just shake it out all over the floor. But I'm pleased to say that that's not entirely how I did my program. A couple of pieces, one by Beat Fura and one by Olga Neuwirt, both of which have a lot going on. There's some extended techniques, the range is big in each. All that pyrotechnic activity, the virtuosic stuff in those pieces, is tempered by a sort of structural feature of the program, which is to have works by Chelsea recurring. So my set is going to open with an excerpt from Chelsea's piece Ho, which is a 1960 work. That is for one female voice. Then that is followed by the Neuviet, which is for soprano and electronics. After that is another Chelsea piece, um, which is an excerpt from Sao. This was all sort of in the time he was working with the amazing Japanese soprano um, Michiko Hirayama. They had a very close working relationship. The middle work of the program, like I said, is Chelsea's Sao, an excerpt from that, which is written for two voices, and I'll pre-record one, so I'll be doing that as a duet with myself. That'll be followed by the Fura, which is his Invocation 6 for soprano and bass flute. And the program will close with another Chelsea, also from Sao, but one of the later movements, which is for four voices. And again, I'll pre-record three of those and do one live. The sort of structural point of having the Chelsea building in that way is to have a kind of textural layering. The Chelsea works are very simple, especially compared to the Neuwied and the Fura. Virtuosity is not their subject. Rather, I would say texture is. And people who are familiar with Chelsea's work will know that he sort of tends to fixate on pitches. So you get very little pitch variation, although microtonally there are departures from the pitches. However, the pieces contain a great deal of variation in a whole lot of other musical ways, dynamically and timbrally. It's quite extreme. I first discovered Chelsea uh, as a female choral singer, um, I guess over a decade ago now, singing his work Iliam. I was quite beguiled by the intensity of the sound world that he puts you in, in an intensity registered in a certain way by the audience experiencing that sound world, but it's also an intensity that's really felt when you're in it, singing it. I loved being in there and I loved the idea that that feeling could be created by something that's extremely simple on the page in a way. So the other pieces that I'm doing, um, I wanted to include the Fura because it's kind of been on my, like, my wish list for a little while. It's also, it's the only piece in my set that includes another musician. And as I was putting the program together, I thought it would be really perverse of me not to include a piece that's at the very least a duo because one of the most thrilling things about making music is making chamber music with other people. I've in fact just launched this whole concert series devoted to, as, as a sort of ode to the electric sexiness that goes on between players on stage when in order to create, a, to perform a piece well, especially a tricky piece that's moving by quite quickly, there's this amazing, apparently telepathic, sort of rapid fire, real time, non-verbal communication that goes on to coordinate the whole thing. And I love that feeling and I love creating it. I also love being in the audience when it's happening. So this Fura piece is quite a good vehicle. So it's his Invocation 6 and it's with bass flute and I have a wonderful flautist, Roberta Michelle, who's going to play with me. Up until very, really very recently, in singing, at least in the Western classical tradition, breath is not supposed to call attention to itself. It's not supposed to be the subject of a piece. You're not really supposed to notice it. Of course, plenty of composers more recently have decided to, to draw attention to it and make it the subject. And this Invocation 6 does do that, both for the flautist and for the singer. I mean, it's full of lots of extended techniques for the soprano and the flautist. But in addition to that, it's also setting a really beautiful text. It's a 15th century Spanish poem sung from the perspective of somebody who has been abandoned by their beloved. I think that the desperation of the abandoned singer is 
conveyed very beautifully. And I, I want to make sure the audience knows that because with so much pyrotechnic stuff going on in the piece, you can be quite distracted by the technical feat of what you're seeing. But I also actually think it's a, quite a beautiful setting of this poem. The other um, more kind of show off <laughs> piece that I programmed is Olga Novet's uh, Nova Minrat. And this piece, I'd, I've never worked on a Novet before, but it was recommended to me by a colleague, actually by Jeff Gabbett, who was in this festival last year. And he just said, I think this would suit you well. I heard a recording to the score and, and thought, oh yeah, it's, it's a really nice fit. It's setting fragments of this William S. Burroughs novel, Nova Express. So he, he built the novel using this cut up technique that he'd used before and that's kind of where you have a text and then you cut it up into a, a whole lot of fragments and then you reassemble it. So it's a fairly experimental work. Across the whole program, language is not being sung normally at all. And in fact, in this Noviet piece, for much of the time, the text that I'm singing will register much more as phonetic objects than as intelligible words. I sang only recently composed music until I was about 18. So I came at everything <laughs> the wrong way around. The wrong way around. I started singing in a children's choir like lots of kids who like to sing and it just happened to be directed by a woman who firstly had a very strong belief that children are as capable of doing difficult music as adults are. And she had a sort of clever approach to this by never actually telling the children she was working with that the music was difficult, which I think, at least for me as a kid, um, I think that was probably a good thing to do. And she commissioned a lot of new works by composers writing quite complex music. So that was the stuff that I sang as a kid. And then my first sort of professional gig as a soloist was when I was about 15. I was hired to sing the role of the boy soprano in Crumb's Ancient Voices of Children. And that was like being inducted into paradise. <laughs> I was like, I just fell in love. And I had always liked singing and liked tackling music of that kind, but some people might watch this video who don't know this piece, so I'll just say a little bit about it. So it's by George Crumb. It's about a 25 minute work for soprano and ensemble. And there's a small role in it for voice soprano. And it is like a jungle of amazing sounds. There's I mean, firstly, he uses circular score notation, which is sort of beautiful. And for me at 15, was quite an interesting thing to, to try. But also there's like toy piano and Tibetan prayer stones. There's a beautiful lullaby. Um, there's also a lot of really wild kind of calling patterns. And at the end, the adult soprano and the boy soprano lean into the body of the open piano and in turns, sing these wild phrases onto the strings which sort of electrify the air around you in return. This was a totally heady musical experience for me and I just thought, oh my god, you can just do this for your life. Alison Morgan, the soprano who hired me to do that, ever since has been like my sort of musical big sister um, and I love her to bits and she taught me for many years and we've performed together quite a lot since then. Creating new artwork of any kind, but especially a musical kind where we're sort of the vehicles for somebody else's artwork. All of that stuff takes generosity and love. So I appreciate the generosity of the act of the composer trusting me with their work and of me being willing to take it on. I love new music audiences. I love them because the audience has to like meet it halfway. They have to sort of bring a generosity of attention to the experience. I sometimes think that they come in part to see us in the ring with the beast. It is so electrifying live. I want to see the body experiencing the music and I want to feel that preposterous sense of risk. I mean, the thing that I think is constantly beautiful and preposterous about what we do is that it could feel so high risk. Like that just standing in a room kind of making sounds in front of people can feel like your very being is at stake. When you live it, like when it's happening, it doesn't seem remotely preposterous. It's just when you put it into words, you think, hmm, oh, that's really decadent and extreme and strange. Thanks to everyone who watched this video. I'm really looking forward to the festival as a whole, but also particularly to appearing on September 3rd. I can't wait.